everybody. We're going to start the last talk for today. It's the road to liberating software at the lower level and it's presented by Paul. Okay, um, hi everyone. So the road to liberating software at the lower levels. What am I talking about here? Well, generally speaking, I'm talking about computers. So the scope of devices that this presentation will focus on is, well, on the one hand, traditional full computers like x86, <coughs> sorry, x86, and on the other hand, embedded and mobile devices, so ARM platforms and MIPS and etc. So on those devices, you find different kinds of chips, right? You have the main processor that is uh, always there, and then you have some auxiliary processors. So on mobile phones, you would find a modem that is in charge of communicating with the telephony network. But you also have a bunch of other um, processors around it, like the VPU that will accelerate video decoding. You have the DSP that will do some other um, signal treatment. Uh, and the GPU, of course, for graphics. You also find code running on controllers nowadays, especially on H um, H sorry, X, um, HCI controllers. So that those are USB 3 controllers. Um, you also have code running on the embedded controller, which is an essential part of any laptop design. But you also find uh, code running on various peripherals, such as Wi-Fi dongles and chips, but also each and every USB input device. So you actually have code running everywhere. Um, and usually the software running on those devices is communi communicating directly with the hardware. Uh, so through registers, and usually that goes um, through some form of hardware access, uh, whether it's PIO, so programmed uh, I.O., or memory mapped I.O. Um, and so this gives that software direct has access to, to the hardware. So the, the low-level software I'm talking about really is mostly drivers, so as part of a bigger operating system. But it can also be a boot up, boot up software, like uh, what we used to call a BIOS or UEFI, stuff like that. Uh, everything that does hardware initialization, um, so you might also call it a bootloader. And of course, we find firmwares. That's, um, what I call firmwares are really the tiny pieces of code that run inside controllers and peripherals, so not the software that is running on the main processor. So really what I'm talking about is stuff that is close to the hardware, right? Um, and my, my intent in that is to show you how to liberate those. But why bother liberating those, those things? After all, um, lower levels are pretty far from the UI. They're pretty far from the, uh, the, the user, right? People don't see it. People will not likely want to modify it because, well, you know, it will just work. And it's not really going to evolve. Right? Um, and anyway, proprietary software gets the job done and it works. And it still often allows you to run a free system like a GNU and Linux system. So you can have a non free boot up uh, software, you can have firmwares, you can have non free drivers, you'll still be able to, to run your GNU and Linux um, operating system. So why should, we, why, why should you care? Well, because I believe free software matters. And I believe it matters because. This is how we, um, we actually keep the knowledge of how the hardware works. This is how we get to understand how the technology we're using actually work, works. So um, this is really a matter of being in control of technology rather than being controlled by it. And there is also obviously the ability to adapt it to one's need. And if you're concerned about privacy and security, well, you should definitely care about free software because it's all about trust and privacy and security. But there are also technical reasons why you would want to have free software at the lower levels. Um, for instance, when the API that the non-free uh, bits are using is changing, that's often the case on Android, where you have modules that are usually non-free software. And the interface to access those modules uh, is evolving along with new Android versions. But when those, um, those modules are non-free, well, you cannot change the interface. So you cannot make them evolve. And this is why very often some Android devices don't get updates, because the APIs um, are, are changing, but the modules are non-free. And so they cannot be updated to follow the interface. And obviously, you always have bugs and things to improve or to fix or to change, right? And even, even if uh, you want to just hack on your hardware, well, you need that to be free software to just have the ability to uh, modify uh, the software that is running. 
So there are some, um, some considerations to have about liberating software. So first of all, uh, let's talk a bit about the manufacturer's positions. Well, they often don't see any um, economical interest in liberating their firmware. Uh, they just want it to uh, be done as fast as possible. And they often have uh, copyrights um, sort of um, issues or they have to be very careful about copyright because often the code they're using in the products, well, they don't fully own it, right? Uh, it might be that the code is coming from various different companies and so they just can't release it as uh, free software. Or that's especially the case when the hardware is made of different, what we call IP blocks, so different hardware blocks coming from different vendors that one vendor will assemble together. And in those cases, the software running on, uh, on, for each of these blocks is uh, the property of the uh, company that designed the block. So it's hard for the uh, company selling the final device to actually make it free software, right? But sometimes the software they're using is already uh, free software and more than that, it's copylefted. That's uh, the case with the Linux kernel, which is under the GPL version two. That's also the case with some bootloaders such as U-Boot or Xloader. And since those are copyleft, well, when manufacturers use them, they have to release the modified source code and so they often do. And this is how we can um, get some source code for devices by manufacturers. But of course, when they do this, we always find out that the, um, the code is of uh, very poor quality because it was written so fast and there were no considerations about doing it clean and the right way. And so this is why this code we, we usually call um, reference code because it's not maintainable and we can't really do anything with it uh, as it is but it does have the knowledge of how it works, so it's still valuable. Um, so when the manufacturer is not really um, cooperating with the community, what we have to do is reverse engineering, and that's, that's a very, very long process. It takes a lot of resources and time, and you need to have uh, pretty skilled people to do this. And of course, since it takes time, you also have to wonder about the long-term interest, because if you start trying to liberate a device and it takes you say five years to accomplish that, well, in five years, the device is probably going to be obsolete anyway. So is it really worth it? That's, that's a question we should, we should definitely um, look into. <clears throat> and well, it's not actually always technically possible to liberate those devices. And there are some uh, recurrent limitations. So the first one, of course, is having the technical knowledge um, at disposal to, to, to free, free devices. It might be, for instance, if you're trying to free a GPS, um, a GPS chip that you need to know a lot about uh, physics and relativity and stuff like that. And so you need to have that technical knowledge, which is not always um, easy to, to get. But there are also um, a lot of legal constraints on reverse engineering. Um, in Europe, it's, it's legal to disassemble um, binary under certain conditions, but it's not in the US. So that's, um, the, the legal constraints are actually pretty high uh, in some cases. And well, even when you're actually allowed to do it and when you have the knowledge to do it, you sometimes don't have the documentation or the schematics that are required to fully understand what the hardware does and what the software you're trying to replace is doing. And so without documentation, it's very often hard to get to any results. But even when you have that knowledge, right, um, you still need the ability to replace the software running on the chip, on the device, whatever. And that is not uh, always granted, right? Because some, some memory where the software is stored is actually read-only. So you can't modify it, you can't uh, run your, your own version. And even when it's not read-only, the interfaces to install your own software can be pretty tricky. Uh, they can be not documented, they can be secret. Right? And some of these are actually external, uh, external interfaces that will require you, require you to open your device, to solder wires, stuff like that. So it's not always very easy. Um, and even when you're, when you're able to install your own software, you still have to be allowed to, to, to load it, to execute it. And what I mean by that is signature verifications. And this is why uh, hardware is doing more and more. Um, it is to actually verify with a public key that the software you have installed is um, actually allowed to run. So it was the, the software itself uh, 
was signed with a private key. And if the private key doesn't match um, the, the signature obtained with a public key that is installed read-only on the device, then the device is not going to allow your code to run. And it means in practice that you cannot install your own version of the software and you cannot modify it. Even if you have like the full source code, even if you can build it, you won't ever be allowed to install it because you don't have the private key that only the manufacturer has. Uh, so that's, that's a very, very big problem. It's actually getting worse and worse every year, and that's, that's pretty terrible. And finally, even when you, when you were able to run your code into whatever device you want to load your code into, well, you still need some ability to debug it, to get some feedback, to be able to investigate what works and what doesn't, because you cannot just load code into whatever device and expect it to just work uh, out of, you know, by first try. It never works that way, so you need to have some debug interfaces. Okay, so now I'm going to, um, to continue with a few examples that I have encountered uh, when developing things. So the Optimus Black is the first example. It's a mainstream device from 2011. It's a device I've been working on um, in order to add Replicant support for it. So Replicant is a fully free version of Android, and this device seemed quite interesting to me. Um, so it's running with a, a Nomap 3, uh, 3630. Uh, it's pretty old, but quite interesting because we have great documentation about it, which is quite rare nowadays. But we also have the technical documentation of the device itself, which leaked on the internet. And it's this file, so I'm not distributing it. But if you were to type these exact words into a search engine, you might find the full schematics of the device. <laughs> but just try, you'll see. Right. Um, and what's also interesting is that the bootloader is used uh, by the main processor of the device. So the very first piece of software that is executed um, at the, 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 the boot, boot up is free software. And it's U-Boot and Xloader. And that source code was released by LG. So that's pretty nice. And people from Android communities uh, got interested in it. So it has uh, Cyanogen mod support, which is a pretty good basics basis to do development. Um, so what's interesting is that the OMAP, version, the OMAP platform exists in two versions. So there is one called HS and one called GP. So HS stands for high security. It means that the, the uh, system on a chip, so the platform, will check the signatures of the, the first bootloader. Um, this means that in practice we cannot replace the bootloader with free software. But there is also another version that is the GP version. Uh, that stands for general purpose. And this one won't check the signatures. So um, on this device, we actually were lucky to find that it's a GP version. So there are no signature checks. And how did we know? Well, in the documentation of the platform, you have a register at this address uh, called control status. And you can see that one of the fields is device tip. And it will tell you whether it's uh, GP or not, so you can see 0B011, that's 3 in decimal. And what you can see when reading this register uh, is that you have 3 at the uh, correct offset. So it's a GP device. So no signature checks, and we can actually run um, fully free bootloaders on it. So OK, let's do this. Let's, let's port uh, the latest version of the reference free bootloader for embedded. So that's U-Boot. But how to do this? Uh, now we know that it can run code. But if I just install my development version on the memory, it won't be able to boot. And I won't be able to install it, install a new version again, because it, will, it won't boot to an interface I can use. And so what, what, uh, what could we do? Well, I found out that the, uh, the boot order of the device, so the, um, the, the decision of which device it's going to boot from, is actually decided by a set of resistors. And by, um, by understanding whether those resistors are pulled up to 1.8 volts or pulled down to ground, you get um, ones and zeros, so bits. And from those bits, you can, and you can figure out from the uh, TRM, so the reference manual for the OMAP platform, you can figure out which uh, boot device is first. And so in the standard configuration, we had MMC, which is the internal storage first, and then USB. And by reading the data sheets, it happened that if you flip a sysboot uh, in the index 5 
from 0 to 1, you'll actually get it to boot from USB first. And so when you have that, you can start sending your bootloader via USB, and it will never break. You can keep sending it until it works. But to do that, we, I actually had to remove a resistor. And so this is a, main, this is a, um, a mobile phone. It's, it's not, very, not very big, and the resistors are not very big as well. So removing one resistor from all of this. Am I done? Turn it on? Sorry. Yeah, I go. Sorry. OK. All right. Um, so yeah, I had to remove that resistor to get USB booting first. And it worked out. I think I did it on like four devices. Uh, it was pretty tricky. But this way, I was able to develop a free bootloader. So I had a bootloader, but then I still need some debugging output, right? And that's ser a serial console. And how do I get it? Well, by looking at the schematics, it appeared that the serial console is exposed uh, in three different places. The first one is a deb debug uh, header that was soldered on the board, but that was not soldered on the production devices. So I could try to solder on one of those pins. I tried, and it failed miserably, because it was on the wrong side of the device, and the, the cable I soldered would break each and every time. Um, the other solution was to use the USB connector, because by some tweaking, you can get um, the serial console from USB. But I was actually already using USB to load the code, and so I couldn't switch to um, serial fast enough. So that wasn't a possibility. And the last thing I, um, I could do was really to use the switch that is used on the USB thing to, uh, to route the serial console to USB. Um, I had to solder a wire, a very tiny wire, on this chip. So you can see it's one of the pins that are described on the layout on the right. And once I did that, I had debugging. So I was able to finally write my uh, free bootloader. And that's what it looks like in the end. I exported um, serial on the right wire. And you can see that it finally showed me some text on serial. So it said free software for free society, because that's why we're here, I guess. OK, so moving on to a new example, Chromebook C201. That's this device. Um, it's a Chromebook laptop from 2015, so it's very recent. Um, it's not very hard to find. It has a rock chip platform, which is interesting because it doesn't check the signatures. That we know for sure. But it had no documentation and no schematics. However, since it was uh, done by Google as part of the uh, Chrome OS uh, thing, it had Core Boot support, which is a free software uh, BIOS, bootloader, whatever you call it. And also Linux, uh, Linux kernel support, and a free embedded controller firmware, which is nice. And so my idea was to try and rebuild all of that, and of course, also adding support to LibreBoot for it along the way. So how to reflash the device? Well, this one has its bootloader stored into a um, SPI flash, flash chip. But the first megabyte of it is uh, hardware protected. And how is it protected? Well, it's actually very nice. It's just a screw that is screwed in at some uh, precise place. And that um, puts the flash chip into this right protected mode. But when you remove the screw, you can actually reflash the, the whole thing. So <laughs> yeah, but actually, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to, um, to ensure physical, uh, well, it's a great way to ensure that you can still modify the device uh, while having security. But it's clear that when um, your hardware is physically compromised, when someone can uh, ac access to it physically, well, it's, the war is lost already. So um, having it as a screw is not, it's a pretty good option, I think. So anyway, I was, I was able to reflash it by removing the screw. But then there was the embedded controller to reflash as well. And that one was a little more tricky, because um, you can trigger it in a state where it will boot or it will reflash its memory from the serial console. And to do that, you have to apply, uh, actually, you have to pull down a, uh, a pin called boot zero, 
But uh, I didn't have the schematics of the board, so I couldn't really know what it was. So I had to do a bit of guessing. And it turned out that out of all the resistors that were on the board, it was this one that was connected to boot zero. So by pulling this pin down instead of pulling it up, I was able to reflash from UART. And so this way, you can have your own firmware running inside the embedded controller, which is nice. But the same problem um, happens again. I still need to find some, to have some debugging and actually to reflash the embedded controller, I need serial console. So how to do this? Uh, well, it turns out that all the Chromebooks have this header, which is called a servo header. And it exposes uh, the, all the serial consoles from the embedded controller and from the main processor, and also many other things. And it turns out that this particular header has some documentation available on the Chrome, uh, Chromium OS wiki. So I just downloaded the documentation, figured out how the pin are, pins are wired, and so I was able to locate uh, where the serial ports are, soldered very tiny wires uh, in there, and finally got serial. So it worked, and I was able to get output as well. OK, so here comes my final example. Um, it's the G505S KB9012 embedded controller. So the G505S is a Lenovo laptop from 2013, comes with an AMD platform, and you also have leaked documentation about it, so leaked schematics for the full laptop, which is pretty nice. It also has core boot support, so there wasn't so much to do on the uh, processor side, on the uh, BIOS boot firmware side. But it also has an embedded controller that is running a non-free firmware. And so I tried to liberate that firmware. Um, and it turned out that the chip, the embedded controller chip itself, has some data sheets, which, uh, which is nice. So it's actually an 8051 CPU with a few controllers around. And it has some internal storage. So same story again. I had to find out how to gain code execution. So there is an interface through LPC, which is like the system bus that allows reflashing it, but it was explicitly disabled by the non-free firmware, which sucks. And in the end, I had to solder wires on the keyboard connector just to have access to an interface that is more or less like SPI, and that would allow me to, um, to reflash the internal memory of, of it. So that's, that's, that worked out, worked out, but you can see that it's still pretty difficult to solder wires um, at a very precise place, and you can see that it's actually not that big, so you kind of need some uh, soldering skills. And after doing that, doing that, I added FlashRAM support. So FlashRAM is the software to reflash whatever uh, kind of um, flash memory that you want. So the patches are still pending review, but they'll be integrated eventually. Uh, same story again, had to find UART, so serial outputs. Uh, it turns out on this one, they are exported on the PCI Express pins. So you could just plug in uh, just any sort of PCI Express card and just solder on the uh, two specific uh, pads that are allocated to it. And from that, you just get ser serial outputs from the, uh, from the embedded controller, which is nice. And there is also um, a pin header that is located here on the board. Um, they were kind enough to keep the marking. So you can see on the data sheet that it's called GP3. And if you just uh, open the board and look for something called GP3, you'll find the same number of connectors. And so this is uh, serial output. So with all that, uh, I was able to gain code execution and get some feedback. OK, so finally, a few words about how, um, how installing the replacement works out for users. Uh, because it's nice to, to, um, to write a free software replacement for a firmware or for something low level, but the installation process is mm, very often not trivial. You can see that if you have to solder wires at a certain place, it's really, really not nice for users. So some skills are required, and of course there is always the possibility of breaking the device, so making it um, unusable because you've done something wrong or you have flashed the, uh, the wrong version of the software or something. So what can we do to make it better? Well, I, I think providing clear and complete documentation is the first way to go, to really make sure that people understand what they're doing and clearly mention that some skills might be required. Uh, 
And when people don't feel like doing things them themselves, sorry, um, encouraging them to actually get in touch with the local free software communities, user group, and hacker spaces. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for your talk. Uh, we're out of time, so there's not a possibility for any questions. But if you have some, you yeah. probably will be happy to answer them. Right. Uh, we also have some uh, keychains with replicant logos, if you're interested. They're 15 euros each. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.